Greetings. I am pleased to report that uh, our long national nightmare is over. Uh, as I stand before you uh, in the headquarters of Searles LLC uh, here in Orlando, Florida, because uh, version 19 of this podcast, I am now feature complete on Becky's fitness app. And, uh, it's been a journey. Let's see. I started uh, in January building um, building out the kind of you know foundational stuff uh, in the form of a a an Instagram clone of sorts, basically a personal blog that you could post things to it that are very similar to Instagram posts. That is to say, images, videos, carousels of images and videos uh, in a little grid like format. And uh, that proved out a lot of the basics of the application, you know, the login, the logout, the uh, uh, active storage, like having a way to push up uh, all her uploads into S3, into AWS, uh, uh, CDNs, content delivery network, right? Like of uh, uh, edge networks for, 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 for public users to be able to access them quickly and efficiently. Got a lot of that out of the way, an admin interface, you know. And it was, uh, uh, that was a little bit delayed after that. I didn't get a lot done because, uh, uh, the, the bathroom remodel took, I wouldn't say it took all of my time, but it definitely sapped me of all <laughs> of my creative juices. Uh, you know, kind of just having my hackles be raised every noise that I heard in the house for some of February, all of March and some of April. Then I went to Japan for a month and I kind of just faffed about as I do and then I uh, came back June 4th or whatever it was sat down with Becky and I said all right starting on June 10th I'm gonna be in uh crunch crunch mode I didn't say crunch mode it's a dumb phrase uh I, I said I'm going to be working really hard <laughs> I'm gonna need some extra support uh, uh, uh in the form of please feed me and uh uh, uh, please, please understand when I'm getting up really early and I'm at my computer and then I'm staying on it until pretty late. And so working probably more hours from June 10 to August, call it 24, than I have, uh, uh, in years trying to get this application done, uh, and ready for launch. And it's not quite there yet. I've still got what looks to be five or six little items to, to cover, but they're no, they're all the features are out. The features are done. Uh, and the, I need to get it done now because I'm, I'm giving a talk exactly one month from today at rails world in Toronto, Canada. And, uh, if you know me, you know, it takes me at least a month to prepare a conference talk. So I've been, um, kind of sweating the, the, uh, what felt to me like a time crunch, even though, you know, increasingly in my life, uh, every single one of my problems is of my own creation and all of my worries originate between my ears, but that doesn't make them any less real, uh, 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 to my stupid lizard brain. So here I am. Uh, it also doesn't make it any less real that I feel pretty good that I, that I got over the hump. Uh, I think I, you know, it's work I can mostly stand by and be proud of, not because it's necessarily, uh, the cleanest code I've ever written or the best um, uh, design or the perfect application that like accomplishes some sort of cool functionality, but because I feel like I made very good use of that time. I feel like as somebody who can tend to be a perfectionist, who very easily gets distracted and dives deep down rabbit holes that are, are not the highest priority thing, burning clock, I stayed focused. I stayed pretty, you know, intently 
uh, uh, just laser focused on whatever the highest priority was. Uh, I avoided a lot of distractions. The only real deviations I took were to write blog posts about some of the things that I was coming across or that I kind of, you know, innovated. And most of the reason I did that was to explain to my future self what the fuck this weird code was. Uh, you know, certainly beats a code common is to have a blog post. Uh, uh, especially if other people pick up and run with the ball. I, lest you think that I do anything to help people. It's very important that I don't start to get a reputation of trying to just uh, be uh, 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 too generous or too interested in others because this comes from a completely selfish place. Not only that, but I, it was probably the first time that I feel like I, I struck the right balance of knowing when to cut corners, what corners to cut, when to call something good enough, when to move on, when to push back uh, on, on a feature or functionality, and then to do it in a way that wasn't going to end my marriage. All of these, uh, the skills that I built over time, it felt like this was a kind of a practicum or a capstone exam. Uh, another reason when I was we were out with friends last night and I, I mentioned it's as a lifelong consultant, who's never really built a product, launched a product that was, you know, as much as anything, like on a, even though I am handing this off to Becky, it's still going to, I'm sure be my responsibility in lots of ways. I certainly don't just get to hand it off and then never have to think about it again. But as an, as an always consultant, who's just sort of a, a thought Lord who just, thinks he knows how to do things right and and tells the world, hey, you should do this and not that, or hey, this is bad, or hey, this is good, and then I'm on, on to the next thing. There's always, you know, there, of course, there's the criticism, like Steve Jobs famously was like, fuck consultants because, like, they, they're not bought into the product. They just, you know, say whatever feels good to them, then they move on to the next project, which in my case is 100% true. So I felt personally attacked. But also the the little voice in the back of my head that says, "Hey, you know, maybe I, maybe I am full of shit. I mean, I certainly sound like a guy who's full of shit when I just say things so confidently." It turns out that I, by following all of my advice, everything went fucking awesome. So it proved that I was absolutely right about everything that I have ever said which is really validating because the most important thing to me is that I just never be wrong uh, and that everyone, you know, gets on board and agrees with that so that I never have to think too hard. <laughs> it's really important to me that every apology that I ever give is sort of of the self-deprecating, feigned, you know, humbling myself uh, without really believing that I did anything wrong. Variety. So we're just diving right into psycho drama here. Uh, but seriously, folks, uh, it's good to be done. That's why it's the, it's the breaking change of version 19 of the podcast. We're feature complete. I am one step closer to being code complete, which is a funny phrase <laughs> because inevitably if you're code complete, but you're not complete complete and anything goes wrong, well, guess what? You're not actually code complete. I had a, I had a, a project uh, that I was working on one of the first first client at Testable and uh, Todd and I were pairing on it and we had a third person who was at the client and he was pairing on it. And we did like, it was a, it was a, it was a big six month long project, uh, but we would, uh, you know, share status at the planning meetings and so forth or the stand up, And we'd, we, we noticed that between ourselves and, and, and the folks on other projects at the, at the client, they'd often refer to themselves as being, well, I'm code complete on this. I'm like day two. And then day three, well, I'm, I'm still, I'm, I'm, I'm code complete, but I'm testing. And then that, that could stretch on for five, six days. And the reason was uh, they were particularly hobbled by a, an extremely slow test suite. Uh, it was Cucumber, uh, uh, you know, like, like English, English language style, domain specific language where you'd write the scripts. But that's not why it was slow. It was slow because they needed a mountain of test data and they were using a tool called Factory Girl. It is now called Factory Bot. But regardless of the gender or anthropomorphization of that particular Ruby gem, uh, it, it, it 
it is it is very slow if you use it to do things like generate 45,000 fucking electrical meters before every single test. <laughs> so that you have enough to, to, to make the calculus of how much load is on this imaginary topology significant. Uh, and so, yeah, it was uh, running an empty test. It took about four minutes. Which means that if you have a, you know, you're writing a non-trivial feature and you want to make sure that it's well tested, test first is basically out. You know, doing test-driven development means you'd, you'd, you'd completely lose your focus um, step by step by step if every line of code or every change to the code was going to be a minimum four-minute wait. So we'd write the code and then we'd test it. And it, it was psychologically just so... I mean, it's a big reason. You see how many tweets I was tootin' between 2010 when I had really fast feedback at my computer and 2011 and 2012 when I had much slower feedback at my computer. Uh, I guess it was really good for marketing that I was just sitting there watching test run so much. It feels, this by, by comparison just feels really good even if I'm not technically code complete. So I'll, I'll, I'll say that. And once it's shipped, once it's out the door, of course, you know, then like any, no matter how well laid plans are, as soon as they come in contact with the reality, they all fall apart. So I'm fully expecting there's a gajillion bugs that I didn't anticipate, things that uh, Becky wishes she'd asked for, and I'm going to have a honey-do list in no time as soon as she's got users who are making improper demands of what they think her application should do. Uh, I, I hope to instill in Becky the, uh, the merits of, of developing a, a spine of just absolute adamantium that says, I don't care what the customers want. I know better. Uh, if, if not, because it, 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 it presents a united front that's like, you know, proud of the work and, 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 and adds some, some, some just, you know, a sense of realness behind just the kind of intangible software, but also because it would be less work for me if she stuck to her guns. So anyway, uh, that's uh, pretty close to being out the door, public, a thing that you could sign up for and use for your own strength training programming. Uh, and yeah, so once we launch, I'll, I'll talk more about it. And, and the first time I'll talk about it publicly is probably at that RailsConf, RailsConf, <laughs> Sorry, Rails World conference presentation because I'll be demoing a lot of the stuff uh, there. Uh, man, even just talking about this, I, I, I got to enjoy this for maybe three minutes and now I'm straight, my brain is right into, oh man, I got to gotta build a brand new talk. I got to go start up Keynote. I got to decide on a color scheme, figure out which fonts I'm going to use because of course I start that all over again every time. Going to decide, am I going to use a lot of stock video? Am I going to go with artwork, custom artwork, AI artwork? What's the motif going to be? All that shit. Uh, it's, I feel like I've gotten fairly good at it, but I've never gotten to the point of like enjoying it. Uh, add that to the list. Of course, enjoying something and being engaged by something are completely different things. I can be engaged by anything. That's my superpower. I wish that my superpower were to enjoy literally any of it, but we don't we don't necessarily get to pick. <laughs> so, speaking of getting stuff done, I uh, was reminded of a phrase because I, I had I I got uh, um, I was able to do a lot for for a friend of mine. They're they're going through some stuff right now, and I uh, was helping them with some logistics. And it reminded me of the uh, phrase because they said, wow, how'd you do that so fast? Like, I, like I, I, I'm so grateful, but like that was like way faster than I could have done it or whatever. And I was reminded of a phrase of a, a, a youth program leader in my uh, high school. He was a really cool guy. He ran the Department of Information Services at University of Michigan, which is sort of like at the time pre-smartphone was the nexus of anyone who had a question uh, in that entire, you know, whatever it was, 30,000, no, 50, I don't know, lots of people in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Any one time anyone had a question, it was like he was the central call center of every single, you know, thing from kids first day can't find, a, 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 you know, the, the, the lecture hall to, 
you know, we're, we're Mazda and we want to film a commercial around this one stretch of road that it turns out is owned or maintained by the, the, the school. Uh, and he was an incredibly productive person. And he said, said to me one day, it's, if you want something done, ask a busy person. And that has always stuck with me because of course it's counterintuitive. But if you ask a person who's not particularly busy to do something now, it's like, oh man, I was completely idle. I was completely bored. And now, and, and I'm on this, you know, let's say I'm just loafing about. I'm, ha I'm, I'm just in a state of non-activity, whether that's a, a leisure activity or just sitting and thinking or taking a nap or whatever. And you hand them something and now you've disrupted their flow, right? Because they were busy doing nothing. And here you are bringing them something to do. So they've got to, you know, in order to show up well and do the thing, they have to completely overcome the inertia of not doing something. And that can be hard, you know, procrastination clicks in. There's, there's also sort of the um, work is like a, a gas it tends to fill its container so if you tell them they've got three weeks it'll be like all right well i'll find a way to turn this into three weeks of work since it's the only thing in front of me right if you ask somebody with literally nothing to do and the typically for somebody who's not doing anything i'm not i'm not trying to make a character judgment that there's some people who do a lot and some people who don't do a lot i think this is entirely an environmental thing in terms of somebody's ecosystem and like kind of like what what their state of mind is as a result you hand them something to do and they, they don't necessarily have an intrinsic pressure to get it done at any speed other than whatever your extrinsic request or demand is, right? Like you tell me you get it done in three days, like I'll, you know, I, I'll uh, mentally allocate time between now and then, but it, I'm probably because I don't have something else in my life driving me to live out of a very rigorous relationship with a to-do tracker or a calendar. I'm probably going to just kind of file that away and let it stress me out passively. So yeah, the, uh, the, the leader would say, if you want something done, ask a busy person because they are already an object in motion. And if you hand them something else, they might be frustrated that you're asking them and not the person to their right, who is extremely not busy. But rather, you know, unless they complain and reject, reject you and have the backbone to say no, uh, it's just another thing on the pile and they're already in get shit off the pile mode. And so they'll get it done and they'll, they'll move on to the next thing. So that's the, I think, when it comes to managing people and designing organizations, having a um, too much slack in the system where anyone or, uh, first of all, if, if too many people are, are basically inactive they don't have enough work to do that breeds all kinds of it not to say it like you know idle hands are the devil's whatever the rest of that expression is the proof in the pudding <laughs> uh i devil's play thing i want to say i don't know i want to say that that's is it like a masturbation thing or is it just like a general catholic vibe um <laughs> explicit podcasting so yeah, I moving right along. I live in a a, a single family detached home, uh, aka a house, and while Florida claims to be land of the free, a surprising number of houses exist in deed restricted development or planned communities where you can't do everything you want with that house and you're subject to, and there's a variety of things you could be subject to, but probably most frequently is a homeowner's association and that homeowner's association, you know, and if you don't let me explain it, like watch the, the last week tonight with John Oliver, he did a great, you know, 30 minutes on what is potentially problematic with homeowners associations, especially when they go sideways, your house is trapped where it is in the situation that it's in. And if you can't 
change that HOA leadership, you're you're kind of fucked. I will refer to it as a HOA from now on. Because that's what I've always called it. A HOA. Which sounds... Uh, sounds like one of my favorite rum drinks at uh, Disney World, actually. At uh, Trader Sam's. There's a, a OA OA. It's a big ordeal. When you order it, there's like lights and stuff. And, and uh, Volcano does things. And, and yeah. So in the, anyway, the HOA has elections, right? Because democracy. And and I can only speak for Florida, but like basically HOAs have like, you know, the uh, 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 force of law in a lot of ways, you know, and with, with great power comes great responsibility. Like we are legally required to maintain our street, let in, you know, uh, have whatever gate system might be in place, work with fire trucks and police officers and all that. But there's an election and I uh, didn't run because I don't want to sit in meetings and argue about what what order people get to speak in due to Robert's rules of order or whatever. I don't want to listen to people or their problems. Uh, in particular, all I want is to be allowed to chop down a tree in my backyard. And that has been a almost two-year journey that I am on uh, because the place we border is, uh, they think it's their tree. I think it's our tree. It sits right in the middle. Otherwise, I've got no business with the HOA. I don't care. But there's this election, and we've got two candidates, one person who's been on the board, and one person who has not been on the board, but who who has uh, taken to Facebook complaining about and spinning stories about the board for a while. And I'll just say, without getting too into it, why can't you all be normal? Like, I wish people, I wish it was more culturally acceptable to respond to the Facebook posts and just say, but, but can't you just be more normal though? Like reread what you said and, and, and ask if somebody else wrote this and you were reading it, that it wouldn't sound like a complete fever dream. I realize we've got uh, Reddit communities and stuff that aggregate this as a form of entertainment called Insane People Facebook. But it's the, th the thing about it is that you've got, you know, you got, you got to live with other people, right? And so I don't want, no one wants to stick their head out and say anything critical of anybody. Because especially if that person has demonstrated a, a willingness and eagerness to filibuster everything and show up at your house and demand uh, uh, to speak and so forth, people just keep their heads down, right? They don't. They won't want to rock the boat. But I'm a I am a boat rocker by temperament, if not genetics. And so I was every time I'm just like I really want to reply and be like, ah, could you just rein this in a little? Just make it twenty percent less intense. I not only would that make me less stressed out reading this email, but I, uh, I think it might be more effective for your cause. So in any case, the election is tomorrow. And, uh, <laughs> even though every single U S presidential election, we're told at least for the last three cycles, this is the most important election of your lifetime. Uh, somehow my stress level about this HOA election is like, almost as high, you know, it's a comparing a, you know, a three out of 10 to a four out of 10, right? It's not, not a big deal. Uh, how much harm could one HOA <laughs> board do in a, in a year or two is a question that I'd rather not learn the answer to, to be honest. Speaking of problematic housing, <laughs> Uh, you might remember when I first moved to, to Florida in 2020, we rented a, uh, we did a long-term rental of a short-term rental, a house that is designed for short-term rentals, but because of COVID, uh, it was not moving. And so the, the owner put us in a traditional lease at a good rate. And 
that was a real bad time for a lot of reasons, but one that really caught me off guard was the house had an address, a street address, because you could drive to it, and you could punch it into Apple Maps, and you could find it. But it did not exist in the U.S. Postal Service address database because it, the house, did not get postal service. Now, you might hear that and think, oh, it's one of those communities where there's like mailboxes and you got to walk to them out. No, I... I paid a pretty penny to get a house that could do that uh, five months later. No, the, these houses don't get postal service at all. They just are ineligible for, for receiving mail. <laughs> and uh, as soon as I heard that, I was like, that can't be true. Surely I could just call, you know, the postal service and say, hey, I would like you to send me mail. But no, they wouldn't. Uh, I had to get a... Uh, whatchamacallit, a P.O. box, had to start shipping my Amazon stuff or anything really to this P.O. box, which was not close, drive there, pick up the mail. And it was so frustrating because Amazon didn't have delivery drivers in that area. And so for the last mile, they would always use uh, a, a USPS service called SurePost where they would hand off from themselves or from UPS or whatever off to the postal service for the last mile. And so they'd claim that they could ship to me and they would be able to ship to me 30% of the time. But the other 70% of the time, it would just say like, hey, you know, the postal service has this. And then 10, 15, 20 days would pass and then it would just get auto voided without a notification. Uh, so it was a great way to keep my spending in check. Additionally, other, other web apps just didn't work. Like we were trying to use Instacart, even though Instacart was in the area, our address was not in it because it turns out that one of the revenue, you know, the handful of ways that the U.S. Postal Service makes revenue is they actually license out that database of all the addresses because pretty much everybody's address is in the a database except for Justin's. And so Instacart couldn't add our address because it couldn't verify it in that database. And fortunately, I, I was still on Twitter.com and I DM'd uh, uh, one of the engineers there and said, please, please, please just, you know, write an if else just for me. I think they were actually also in, in Ann Arbor, come to think of it. Smart people in south southeastern Michigan. Uh, so I don't miss that at all. Uh, uh, you know, probably I'm sure that HOA is even less fun because it's a whole bunch of Airbnb owners. And uh, they were having a great time until about 2020. <laughs> and now there's, uh, yeah, the economics of, of, of buying an air, a home designed to be an Airbnb when literally thousands and thousands of homes are going up every year in the exact same area with the exact same purpose. Uh, a lot of those don't rent, but they have to rent to make your mortgage payment. So... Glad, a lot of unhappy people. Of course, a lot of unhappy people is sort of the uh, status quo of our existence. Speaking of homeownery stuff, I, I had a great experience working with the federal government recently because of a bad experience working with a cable company, right? <laughs> I, can't tell, I can't tell a single fucking story that's just like good, right? Even the big thing, the big thing I worked months on, I built this fucking application is followed immediately like, oh God, I got to build this conference talk. But that's just me. That's what she signed up for, I guess. So anyway, I, cable company, a tech claimed that they had bought exclusive rights to my neighborhood beyond the first phase of houses. And I was in one of the later phases. And CenturyLink, who has much better, faster service, doesn't, uh, uh, won't serve my house in particular. You can literally like the house number above and below me are both in their system, but my exact house number is not. And you call them and they're like, yeah, it's just not there. And there's nothing we can do. And it's kind of a black hole and there's a hold on it. And it's like, you know, legally we just can't do it. So all the information that I had was like spectrum had somehow attained an exclusive agreement with, I don't know whether it is the HOA, or the county or whatever, because I don't know how any of this shit works. So I called them, called them, gave up, and, and you know, couldn't get an answer, just got the runaround. And then I filed an FCC complaint. You know, I'd had a, a, I had a stiff drink. I had a, uh, what was it? It was some kind of whiskey drink. What did I make? It was a whiskey sour. 
I've made a whiskey sour. I sat down and I said, you know, today's the day that I'm going to see like, what the fuck can, can I even do about this? Uh, somehow I land at the FCC, the federal communications corner of the government. <laughs> uh, and it's got a little form and I fill out the little form. It says, Hey, suggest, you know, it's like kind of the, uh, probably similar to like the paper reduction act where they tell you how long the forms are going to take out. It w- it said it, this, this form will take 15 minutes. I was in and out of there in like four minutes. I was just like, boom, shakalaka, here you go. Here's my contact info. And then the craziest thing happened. I thought at the end of that, it was going to be like, I hope you feel nice with your feelings. Goodbye. But instead it was like someone from your cable company will contact you within X days. And X was, you know, not comically high. I was like, huh, look at that. And if literally three days passed and then suddenly a very well-to-do sounding employee at, at Spectrum called me. He had a real name, a real last name and a real phone number that he was calling from on a real desk. And then later he followed up with an email from a real email address. And at the bottom of that email address or email that he sent me was his real name and a real email signature with all of his contact information. And I could just like contact him just like that. I could invite him to a barbecue or ask him to weigh in on my HOA election. So he, he was super kind He was like totally understanding. He's like, here's what the process is. Thank you for being a customer. Understand like, you know, you're frustrated. Like I'd love to hear a summary now so that you can tell me and then I can forward you to the right researchers because I've got these researchers that work with me and they'll figure it out. And uh, so I explained it and he's like, all right, you don't have to say anymore because that, you know, it's above my pay grade, but I'll uh, uh, forward it to them and you'll hear from them within 24 hours. And, And sure as shit, a researcher called me within 24 hours was prepared with everything, had all of the, you know, documentation about like my county, my, 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 the development we live in and stuff and talking to her and explaining like how funky this thing I'd heard was because, you know, uh, my, 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 my legal representation chat GPT had said that this kind of agreement for a single family detached homes is very uncommon. Uh, and if there's not a bulk agreement from the HOA and like people are contracting individually with the, um, broadband providers, Like, in fact, it's either not enforceable or it could be illegal. Um, So it was a weird thing that I was expressing to this person. They'd never really heard a story just like this, but she still heard me out and she pulled up all the relevant documentation and she uh, 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 assertively said, that is not, whatever you heard was wrong. You are free to go talk to CenturyLink and I will even send you documentation. I'll document this call so that if they say anything, Again, next time you call them, uh, you can furnish that and tell them, hey, no, they're they're welcome to go and rip out our fiber and put put in their fiber. And I was like, man, where where am I? This is awesome. I uh, big fan of, I, I suppose, the Biden administration, FCC, FCC. And I'm, I'm not sure if there were um, humans working there during the previous administration or if it was just a bunch of rat people, but maybe it worked then, too. Uh, uh, but I'm real glad, uh, it was a great experience. And now do I still have, do I have the faster internet? Uh, uh, no, because I called CenturyLink and they said like it was outside their business hours. So hey, I'll, I'll get around to it. And then dear listener, if I can pull this off, I'll go from 30 megabits per second of upstream to one gigabits per second. And that my friend will allow me to live stream shenanigans with minimal fuss. I'll get OBS and I'll just be coding away or chatting away or building stuff or whatever the fuck. Playing video games. I don't know. Uh, to to sate whatever it is inside me that wants to just constantly share my existence with you. Oof. Oh, uh, man. Well, that's, a, that's most of what's going on in life. I guess while I'm going through just like dad gripes, <laughs> uh, the only thing I can think of that maybe you have thought of is, you know, bank apps, you, you log into a website or an application from your bank. And the only reason that you're logging in is you need to copy paste the account number of your account in some other thing, like a direct deposit thing or an ACH thing or a wire instruction. 
and they need your account number. And you're like, I need my account number. And if it's not a checking account, because then presumably you might have a check somewhere that you could look at, this can be really difficult because almost every bank, every certainly every bank that I've ever used, hides the account number as if it's like a password everywhere in the application. Now, if I was a Twitch streamer, I would understand. You don't want to just, you know, share that with everyone because that plus a couple other pieces of information and you got a stew going. But if I'm at the, in the privacy of my own Vision Pro headset and only my eye holes can see it, I feel like I can be trusted with my own account number, especially because if you have access to your account in almost every case, if you go to the statements tab and you download your most recent statement, you'll get a PDF of whatever they would have mailed you if mail was still a thing. Or if you're, if you're have the, if you have mail privilege, meaning M A I L privilege, and you receive postal service at your address, the thing that you would have gotten, that PDF, that has the real account number on it. You just go to the bank website and then you and then you you log in. You can't see your account number in any of the 45 fucking screens where it's just kind of masked out with some asterisks and then the, the last three digits, like that's going to help you. You go to statements, you download the statement, you can see the whole thing right there. Like, so it's not like there's... Eh, it would make sense to me if there was some additional level of authentication, Right? Oh, well, to get to your statement statements, because this has your account number on it, like we will also need, you know, the, the date that you last spayed or neutered a dog and not, not by hand. Come on, get your ugh, gross. I mean, like you paid somebody to do it, right? It would say all this in, in the form. It would explain what, what I'm, what I'm putting down here. And then you'd provide that date. And then it would, then it would let you download it. Right. So like some, some, like, cause if somebody, if everyone who has access has the ability to see the, why are you making me go through these extra steps is my point. If it's about screen sharing or screen recording or something like that, like, like let you let people fucking click on the masked. What are, what are we doing here? So anyway, <laughs> you know, I live a, a, a just fascinating and engaging uh, uh, life when the shit that, that, that is top of mind is being like, Oh, I got to talk truth to power into a fancy upside down microphone. Who boy, <laughs> it's just this dreck. Uh, so yeah, I'm pretty fortunate that uh, nothing in my life matters. I guess it's time for some follow up. Uh, I, uh, last Last time around in version 18, I was talking about how I had a new iPad coming, but that it hadn't shown up in time for me to review it properly. Now, of course, this iPad is now, it launched in May, so it's, we're not talking about any sort of breaking news here, but it's new, you ain't seen it, it's new to me. I got the 13 inch, which had the most pronounced weight loss. I think, I think that these iPads are healthy at any size, but... The 11 inch was already quite svelte. The 13 had more to lose because it was going from that mini LED display to OLED. And it is, it's, it's very light. It feels like I could just walk around with it because it does the, the old 13 inch felt so heavy. You may as well have it in the, in the magic keyboard case all, all the time, which is only heavier. The new magic keyboard also being lighter. But like if it's if it's never going to feel light, you may as well have it in maximum full of shit mode, you know, just heavy mode. And the whole thing combines like three pounds, which is more than a MacBook Air. So the end result and I had that Mac, uh, that iPad for several years. The end result was I never took it out of the house because I always had a lighter computer to take with me. So then it just it, it instantly became relegated to this is the thing that I use to watch videos at night while I play video games. And very I was using it the same way that your eight year old uses their iPad. Uh, in theory, iPads are great for you get the pencil, right? You draw your notes, you write things. You could just use it as a way to get focused work done without the trappings of Mac OS and multiple windows and all the things, right? Even though that sort of supports that shit. But there's something I think when an iPad becomes so big and heavy that you don't feel comfortable just holding it without a case, without a stand, 
it loses that thing that kind of made the iPad a product, which is it's a tablet. It's a thing that you're holding. <laughs> it's just a glass of content. It's a big phone, right? If it's never any of those things, it's a bad laptop is what an iPad is. And I was coming to that realization. I think that's that plus a really great sale, uh, some sort of pricing mistake, I almost want to think, at Amazon. Uh, so I was like, that that's why. I'm willing to try this out to see. I doubt that the OLED screen would be that much better. And, and spoiler alert, it's better. The, the colors in particular, really vibrant. If you like the big, punchy, saturated colors, very nice. Still calibrated quite well. But if it's light enough that I'll actually like pick it up and use the pencil and write notes, then that, that would be a big difference, especially if I ever took it any place. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I, that was what I wanted to find out. I immediately put um, developer beta 18.1 and Apple intelligence on it as soon as it came. And so I was doing the full screen Siri thing. And it's uh, it means I have the when I use the pencil, it will a new feature. You, you scribble shit in your chicken scratch, you know, as I do my best pharmacist impression. Uh, well, wait, hold on a sec. The thing is that doctors writing prescriptions have terrible handwriting. It's the pharmacists who have to read the terrible handwriting, which, if anything, that that makes me think that pharmacists might actually, you know, out of out of out of empathy, at least, they probably work on their handwriting a little bit more. Anyway, so yeah, you write your chicken scratch in this just unintelligible gibberish, and it actually does a really good job of like taking your crappy letters and making them look like real letters, but still looking like you're the person who wrote them. And it's a, uh, it's wonderful because I I stopped writing notes on my iPad in part because I could never read them, and now I can kind of read them. Uh, so that was that was pretty neat. Uh, I noticed there's also a new Japanese handwriting uh, keyboard. Previously, there'd been a Chinese handwritten keyboard where you can draw the Chinese characters and stuff, and and Japanese users would sometimes use it, even though you start to get into encoding and font errors, especially around um, characters that might differ significantly but uh yeah so the the pencil story is really great i like the pencil a lot the um, it it's got new features can do barrel rolls it, it can highlight over stuff it's got like a new really the only difference is that the uh when you squeeze it it has like a click and then there's like a control wheel that's like right in front of you that's nice i don't know the uh the new magic keyboard with uh it's a shorter cantilever so it, it's the, the iPad is less kind of pronounced in your face because it doesn't have to be in order to like not fall over. Uh, and that allows room for them to have the function keys. Function keys are great. Everyone loves function keys. In particular, the trackpad's nice because it's a MacBook style trackpad with the uh, force touch instead of the, uh, was it Steve Jobs who said it was kind of like a, uh, a diving board, <laughs> you know, like where it's a big button in the front. Um, the clicks work from anywhere on the, on, on, on the trackpad. That's pretty cool. You know, I'm, the, the the aluminum, you know, uh, palm rest is definitely nicer than the kind of generic cloth one. And like everyone else is saying too, the, the outside bits being that kind of soft gummy material is probably quite protective on that magic keyboard, but it's not, I would not call it nice. It's, it, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a consumable product. It will wear down. It'll, it'll fray, but overall, you know, uh, it is an iPad and iPads are still iPads. And they, that means that they are kind of hamstrung by an operating system that doesn't know what it is. It knows what it is. It is a thing for people who are not trying to do anything too serious, but it's also striving or has all these kind of half, half-assed experiments inside of it that you, that you are free to turn on like stage manager, which I did turn on, which try to make it something else. And I, I turned on Stage Manager for the first time since it first came out, not because Apple actually did anything new with it in iOS 18. To my knowledge, they didn't. It's mostly the same. Maybe little little tweaks. I turned on Stage Manager because I've now uh, uh, I've got several apps in my life, like Eight Sleep, uh, so to control the bed, and Macro Factor, which I'm using for macro tracking for nutrients. Nutrients. God, what the fuck. 
weirdo, I, uh, which I use to log my food so that it can do math at me. Those apps don't... I think it's that they, they publish in the iPad app store, but they don't have a um, widescreen view. It only shows you the port portrait view. Whereas if they had unpublished from the iPad app store, you could install the iPhone app and then use it in landscape mode in full screen. So as a result, you end up with, you'd launch their app if you don't have stage manager en enabled, you'd launch the app and then it would take up the whole screen, but in nine by 16 sideways. And then you'd have to kind of like, you know, rotate your iPad 90 degrees and sit it vertically with the keyboard now on the left, just uselessly dangling there like a Stonehenge. And so you just sit on the table and then you'd use it, right? That's a bad user experience. I don't know if I have to tell you that. But the stage manager will let you use an iPad app that is wanting to be portrait mode like that uh, in a, you know, in the laptop orientation. And then you can move that little window around. So I've been trying to force myself to use stage manager just for the three, four, five times a day that I need one of those two apps. And it is buggy and I wouldn't recommend it. But uh, if you want to be using an iPad, guess what? This is the only show in town, so what's the point in complaining too much, I guess? Uh, yeah, really good hardware. I don't know. It's a, The best time to buy Apple hardware is the first fucking day that they release a brand new design because it's always going to have, almost always going to have the best specs, a huge spec bump, a huge design improvement, lots of life changes, uh, uh, like quality of life improvements, uh, any new accessories or whatever, although they do manage to throw away and restart iPad accessories almost every single uh, revision. And the accessories are going to have the longest lifespan, right? I bought my original Magic Keyboard in 2020, maybe, or like really early 2020 before COVID. Or oh, I don't want to say before COVID, you know, before COVID got too fun. Uh, and that was able to be reused for several iterations afterward. So all, all those reasons, the best day to buy any Apple hardware is right when the new design comes out. Um, cause it, it may, it might be a while. And for a lot of products like home pods and monitors, they might not do another revision at all for five years. So you may as well get in while the getting's good. It's not like the price goes down either. They, 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 they protect their prices by keeping the prices of what, the, what they are. And in the U.S. at least, probably the best thing to come out of the fact that Apple now sells through Amazon is that they dump a lot of their channel inventory because they're clearly providing uh, Amazon with the discounts that, you know, we see. Uh, and I don't have to drive to a Best Buy to get them. So that's great. Another thinking about the eat sleep and my, my refrigerated bread, <laughs> bread system. <laughs> I have a refrigerated bread system. It's called a refrigerator, and you probably are already familiar with that, but the eight sleep is the refrigerated bed system, and that's what I sleep in at night. And sleep has been rough this year because I have developed a, a nasty snoring habit, and I've talked on previous uh, iterations of this program that uh, I have an app called Koala Nap, which is a weird app that you got to have your phone with you at bed and a, and a watch paired with it. And it listens, it's, it uses the phone's microphone all night long to try to listen for what its algorithm thinks are snoring sounds. And Becky, within a couple of weeks, was like, I think that you have successfully trained yourself to not get these wake-up alerts on your watch by changing the sound that you make to something kind of like an angry purr. <laughs> I just kind of have this snarly growl sound that I make. So anyway, the update is, I still do that. And uh, I don't really know the solution. I'm trying to get, I'm trying to reframe for her. It's like, hey, instead of being annoyed by this sound, just imagine I'm purring. I'm really happy. Because uh, I found that when I get woken up in that state, that's, I, I am not going to pretend that I know the difference between deep sleep and REM and like which one lasts for how long. I just know that waking up in exactly that little window seems to be the worst fucking time to wake me up from a how's Justin going to feel tomorrow perspective. So that's a real problem. I don't know. I, I've got, a, I, I've got a, an opportunity to go see a, uh, do a sleep study 
And I'm going to get around to that as soon as I'm done with this fucking talk. <sighs> because what do, what do I need sleep for? Uh, I got four or five more weeks of just absolutely killing myself to do a lot of hard work for probably zero dollars. But I do it for you. I do it for you because I'm a humble and I'm a generous person who just wants to help people. Don't listen to that other guy earlier in this show. The one who came out and was like, hey, I'm a selfish asshole. And I basically just use my blog as a bookmarking system because I'm too lazy to write code comments. Two things can be true at once. Speaking of two things being false at once, uh, I've been using GitHub Copilot for since November 22. And uh, mentioning that on the show, uh, a fellow podcaster and listener of the program, Matt Swanson, he of the Yagni podcast, which I hope he brings back for a season three because he's a really good interviewer. Uh, Matt uh, wrote in and he said, hey, have I, have I tried to sell you on Super Maven yet? Uh, as a recovering Java developer, the idea of a product being called Super Maven uh, sounds like a, uh, sounds like Super COVID, right? Or like Super Chlamydia. Like, I don't, I don't want that. <laughs> just, just the regular Chlamydia was plenty for me. Thanks. No, Super Maven is a, like a copilot, it feels just like copilot. It costs ten bucks a month. You activate it in your uh, VS Code or whatever uh, uh, as a, as a plugin, and unlike copilot, it will a copilot can do this if you're on an enterprise tier, you know, big business paid copilot. But if you're just an individual, I don't think you can buy this. Unlike consumer grade copilot from github super maven will look at all your code in your project and so when it makes recommendations to you it's not just looking at the open tabs it's looking at all the code in the project and so you can start writing something the autocomplete is going to not only be more relevant it's not instead of guessing what the code that you are about to write is based on an entire corpus of training data you know just a, a big estimate it will do it based on how you write other code or even specific references that, that are in your code base. And it's, it's, you know, it's still not perfect, but it's so much closer to being right that I, um, I have found that it seems to be inferring what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to anthropomorphize it, but like it, when I start doing something, for example, like an extract refactor and I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to write in a new method name. I'm going to start, do uh, start the def. I'll type def in Ruby to like begin defining a method. It'll know the name. It'll grab all the parameters. It'll name the parameters. And then like I'll hit tab and accept that. And then the very next tab is going to be like, I'll blad in the exact same code that I know you're about to extract. Things like that. Um, it's, yeah, it's, if you have tried Copilot and found it wanting, or if you're just the kind of person who tries out all these different AI coding assistants, this is the least bad one that I've tried for the relatively low amount of fuss that it takes to set up. And still, I am not 100% sure that it hasn't wasted more time than it saved. Because the, these things are just... The, the analogy that I can't escape is that they're just like uh, assisted driver technologies like, like adaptive cruise control, where they're really nifty out the gate and you turn them on and then they're mostly fine most of the time. But as soon as your attention drifts, they become incredibly dangerous because when they're not right, you're not looking, you're no longer driving. And so I'll very often be like, Oh yeah, that, that, that you know, that seems right ish. And I'll hit tab and I'll move on to the next thing and then realize like, Oh, it completely botched it, it did the wrong thing in this code and i can see it once i inspect it but like i when you get used to not reading your own code closely it's at, at least i'm a solo developer and i know like i must have been the one to put that code there i imagine if i was working in a team or something i'd be in get blame constantly be like who's the chuckle fuck who did this and of course um, our, our source control systems can't say it was the ai you know so then you're just like what was i was i drunk I know it was high, but like you usually I keep it together. So anyway, super Maven, that's the closest thing you're going to get to an endorsement of that. Uh, I had a, the funniest thing is it has picked up on my snark 
as well. So it not only has it picked up on my coding style, but it knows that if I'm going to write a code comment that I'm a shithead about it, like that I'm going to be like a, like a jerk to myself. And so in some, sometimes it's like, you know, cute, right? Like, um, I was using an HTML grid and there was a problem, uh, and I deleted a bunch of like kind of boilerplate code that I didn't need anymore. And, uh, I wrote over the grid, a, co a comment and I said, let like L E T. And then if it, it, it auto completed for me, it offered this auto completion. It said, let's see how that works out for you. And I was like, damn, like, that's not what I was going to be right. But what I was going to write down, but like, I feel called out <laughs> sure enough. The thing that I was doing didn't work. So super Maven, pretty fun. Uh, somebody was talking to me about, uh, they, they linked me to the get scm.com page. It's like where it gets, you know, documentation is and, uh, GitHub paid for that. They sponsored the creation of that. And in part because Scott Chacon, who worked at GitHub was, had written the book on Git, uh, the most prominent one at the time. And it was kind of like a sort of a sales channel for that. But of course, anything that they do to promote the usage of Git, uh, you know, redounds to their benefit as a co company. And uh, a friend of mine, Jason Long, who uh, probably still lives in Hilliard in, in central Ohio near Columbus, or maybe he was Grandview. I don't know. One of Columbus is, contains multitudes. So anyway, my Ohio friend, Jason, uh, he pinged me and he said, Hey, I was, I'm working on this contract to make this logo. What do you think of this? And I offered some feedback because his looked like a pitchfork at like with multiple 90 degree angles to indicate forking. And I was like, well, actually, when you fork a branch, there's not this other vector, right? You kind of just, it's more like an angle. And so then he updated the, the, the logo to be just a straight line with a branch off of it. So just it's two lines total with that like orange round rect. And uh, every time I go to the get SEM page and I, or anytime I see the get logo, I'm like, huh. Remember when I like, I, I made that. I didn't make that. I helped make that. I provided that exact piece of feedback that I'm sure somebody else would have, but instead I did it. Uh, Jason is a fucking fantastic designer, by the way. A very, very good designer. Uh, super accomplished, had a long run at GitHub uh, before moving on to planet scale. I'm not sure if he's still there or what he's doing now, but Jason Long, everybody. Uh, a lot of the best designers that I know are it's kind of like how I feel, right? Like most of the great developers I know are team players. They work in big companies. They work with big teams. They do a lot of mentoring. They do a lot of like, they work, they, they are one of many doing whatever it is that they do in their organization. A lot of the best designers that I know, they are the only designer in the room or they have uh, their own remit and a lot of creative control over what they're doing. And that's more how I want my life to be and how I've kind of organized my life at this point is like, it's not that I don't like other developers. I don't like working with people. It's just that I don't like other developers and I don't like working with people. So I want to have that same creative control and that same kind of room to roam and, and experiment and try stuff and put my name on things. Like that time, you know, when I invented the, the Git logo. <laughs> I... So Jason's one of those, right? Like can run a design for a big ish app or company. Basically, you know, he can, he can chew off a lot on his own. Uh, so yeah, Jason, cool guy. I had a uh, moment texting with Becky. I realize I'm, I'm still in follow up. I'm not sure how this landed here other than it's a, <laughs> one of my favorite running jokes <laughs> is, uh, When you have, uh, you and somebody else, you arrive at the same idea asynchronously, right? You, maybe you text something, they don't see the text, they propose the same thing. I was like, ah, oh, yeah, we had the same idea. And then what do you say? You say, great minds think alike. But I always, I always hated the corniness of great minds think alike. And so I, you, I say, yep, GMTA, instead of saying great minds think alike. And my favorite thing about it is that approximately zero times has anyone ever unwound that acronym back into GMTA back into to, to, to great minds think alike. And then that's funny to me because, well, I guess these great minds don't think alike because I thought of that acronym and you couldn't. 
you did you failed to piece it together now I, did, I don't do that out of cruelty i do it because like at some point i saw that acronym online and if you google what does the acronym gmta stand for i am quite confident it's not some sort of good morning america spinoff it's going to tell you a great mind sick alike and if it doesn't then i'll go write a blog post and try to move the needle on that one uh yeah so that that's what passes for follow-up <laughs> thanks for thanks for hanging out thanks for spending some time with me whatever you're doing i hope it's uh i hope it's i hope it involves heavy machinery but no no substances that come in bottles that say don't operate the heavy machinery try to keep those separate so i try to keep all my pills away from my john deere tractor when i can So while I'm just uh, standing around here and uh, telling bad jokes, extemporaneously at least, none of my jokes were written down first. So that should give me some credit. Mostly it's just I, as I speak to you, I find myself referencing stuff from earlier in the conversation. It's a callback, and everyone loves callbacks. At least uh, I hope you do. If you're still here, you probably do. And if you're not here, then... Maybe you don't. So uh, you might know that uh, one of my best friends uh, on this planet. I guess I sh should. I don't mean to imply I've got friends off the planet, but one of my very best friends is Aaron Patterson, and he uh, uh, he goes by Tender Love on a lot of the Internet. You can find him at his homepage, tenderlovemaking.com. <laughs> And he is uh, gone. He's, he's traveling in a remote location. And we both have the iOS beta. And he has been iMessaging me. And he's been iMessaging me via satellite, which is a new feature in the beta. And it's currently free, although it definitely seems like something that's going to get rolled into one of the uh, paid subscription plans before long. Because I can't imagine it's that cheap, especially with the kind of useless nonsense he is choosing to, uh, to text me. Like, hey, FYI, a, a hornet or a wasp fell in my beer. And I was like, I'm so glad that I had to go to space <laughs> and then come back down from space uh, so that I would hear. Uh, and I think real space too, right? For all you Starlink stands out there, that's not real space. That's just that's just low enough to be creating light pollution for, for astronomers and uh, future future satellite junk for causing collisions. Now, space space, like the, I'm pretty sure these are higher up satellites, like the cool ones. So that's that's where this pun came from. Would you believe it? Aaron sent a pun from his phone to outer space back to my actually I read it on my Apple Watch. I, I spoiled myself because it was sent in invisible ink, but I fat fingered it and uh, I read it early. So normally I read these things. I read them live on air and you get my real reaction in real time i'm gonna do my best to show up here for you and read it with a with a an appropriate reaction that merits the 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 tone and tenor of the pun here we go ahem Going camping with my family this week. It's intense. And you might... You might require me to reread that second sentence. It's intense. As in, it is in the plural form of tent. There are multiple tents at this campsite. Which is good. I mean, Aaron's got a big enough family. It's like, you know sisters and parents and stuff so it's just it's probably accurate that there are multiple tents is my guess uh but uh like a lot of his puns they look real good in text but then uh they require better elocution than i have to successfully deliver them via audio and uh if it if 19 episodes of this podcast in i still haven't done anything about that i think it's just going to be part of the program <laughs> it's a uh um an endearing little quirk that uh, he sends me puns that are hard to read and I am bad at reading 
those puns. Going camping with the family this week. It's intense. This is a classic. This is an instant classic, right? It's probably, if I had to guess, on a Laffy Taffy somewhere, right? It's on a popsicle stick. It's definitely you Google going camping with my family this week, and or maybe not the exact setup, right? But this is a this is absolutely a pun that we've all if we haven't heard it before, it's like that straightforward that we've heard it before. But that said, we have had such a run of uh puns that only make sense in that exact moment or puns that are pretty tortured that I want to reward Aaron for this straightforward, you know, just down the middle change up uh, and rate this one pretty high. Where does it go? Let's see. So the number three on our list, writing an emulator seems like a lot of work if you just want to game the system. That one is, I really like that one. The uh, number, I don't think it's better than that. The number four, I loved playing AAA games as a kid, but replacing the batteries got real expensive. Also real good. Hmm. I think this is probably our new number five following uh, version 17. I'm in Singapore this week for Red Dot RubyConf. I have learned that many people here either love the King of Fruit or they're just Endurian in it. Endurian it. Ugh. Uh... Yeah, that one I probably rated too high. <laughs> See, I'm I'm not the most impartial judge, right? I'm 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 trying to take uh, Aaron's ego into account. The new number five, and now uh, because I'm doing all this in a markdown table, I, I now have to manually update five through eighteen in this table because uh, I don't have a better way of doing it. Uh, and I don't trust ChatGPT to not fuck something up if I ask it to do it. So I've got uh, the new number five pun from Aaron in version 19 of Breaking Change. Going camping with my family this week. It's intense. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I wonder... I guess we, we've got a really strong relationship. You know, Aaron and I have been very good friends for over 10 years. Uh, I I sometimes forget to ask him for a pun. I often forget until like the morning that I'm going to record. And I did ask him this one a couple days in advance. But I'm worried, like, what if I ever really want to sit down and record? And I can't because I don't have a pun yet. And I'm not, like, I, I'm just, I've got a frustrating amount of, for somebody who's so self-centered, a frustrating amount of integrity around like, violating rules even if nonsense rules i made up it's like i nope sorry just can't do it i'm gonna go have to read a book uh so so this 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 segment is staying whether i like it or not a segment that needs less introduction than the rko morse code up there is uh the news so this is a, you won't find this in any, uh, 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 junket newspapers, blogs. I, because I, as far as I know, it hasn't been widely recovered, but I've, I've gotten a couple different, uh, I get a, so as a, if you've ever been a co-founder or a C-level executive, even at a sort of like a hilariously small scale company, like, you know, when I was CTO of 50 people, <laughs> uh, not the, Hey, not for nothing. But like, it's not, it's a, that's a way different thing than CTO for a big company. But for the vast majority of people just doing shitty sales outreach and they're, they're paying zoom info or whatever for a, a huge list, they just want titles. Give me all the people in this geography with this title and the, uh, they, you can segment in other ways, but, but it results in me getting a shitload of B2B sales outreach emails. And there's this new trend, this hot new pitch that I've been seeing. What they often, there so, so, so examples of trends. Like one trend was, uh, hey, every time 
I reach out to somebody, I'm going to record a custom video with their name in it. And I'm going to send it and say, hey, this video has got your name in it. And then like they do their spiel or whatever. It's like, hey, Justin, I was just, you know, doing whatever and doing my laundry. How are you doing today? And it's got this like sort of like the girlfriend experience aspect to it, which I can appreciate. But <laughs> then they're like, oh, and I just I was just wondering, you know, it's like I was thinking about you and your business and how, man, you must really struggle with like uh, HR compliance in this state. Yeah. So anyway, I'm going to go do the laundry now and you just hit me up and you can, you just reply to this email. You don't have to make a video. It's all right. Cool. See you, bro. Click, uh, that those little video pitches. I don't know if they're still effective. Uh, they did not work on me. I'll say, <laughs> uh, instead I just mostly posted them to Twitter. No, no, I don't think I ever had the gall to do that. It just seems because like a lot of the people, uh, uh, not to say that like working as a uh, entry level sales rep is, is tantamount to human trafficking, but like those people are not always excited to be in that role. <laughs> uh, so I, it's, I don't want to single out any individuals, but the, the pattern is terrible. So anyway, uh, <laughs> this new trend, I think what they do is they point an AI thingy either a web tool or they download my blog posts they ingest a bunch of justin searles flavored content and after looking at the target and 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 absorbing stuff that they say have an llm write an earnest question just a, a question asking a question about something that they wrote hey i saw this post about this and then like earnest like like literally analyze something about the post in as if you were an expert in the topic and then ask a real question that another expert might ask. You can imagine the chat GPT prompt that goes into this. And so then I get an email and it's like somebody with a human name and they're asking me a, a question about stimulus or whatever. And there's no, there's zero sales overture. There's no signature saying that they're a head of business development. There's no, uh, uh, it just, it's a personal looking fucking email with a personal looking fucking name. And they're asking me about a blog post. And I'm like, all right, well, cool. This is a human. And then I reply and I, because I, I care about people and want to, you know, don't get me wrong. I don't care about people, but I want to do, a, I want them to like me. So I will spend time writing a reply. And as soon as I hit send, I'll get some like automatic, yo, download this PDF and just put this fucking thing. In. And then it's like, we can help you with HR compliance in Ohio. And I'm like, fucking shit. Uh, I got, I got had, it's just another way to goose engagement. And then of course, I'm sure when you reply to an email that comes in via a Google mail account, that probably increases their, uh, whatever the page rank equivalent is, right? Like their, the, the, whatever domain they sent you that email from is probably now considered slightly more trusted because it, it got engagement. So then, uh, uh knowing that when, <sighs> Look, I like to disincentivize uh, sales outreach to me by replying and saying, I'm going to report this as spam if you don't stop. Uh, and then they reply, well, why would you do that? I'm just trying to make a business. And then I will reply, report it as spam. And then I go to Gmail's interface and I click the report junk or report spam button. And I used to just mark as junk in the Apple Mail app, but I'm, it didn't seem like it was having the same effect. So I report as spam in Gmail. I'm doing my part. So uh, if that's you, if you've written one of these, go fuck yourself. Please. But but if you, man, I, I'm, I, I got to say, though, I'm really struggling to try to figure out HR compliance uh, in, in, in this new state that I've just opened up in. So if anyone knows anybody that can help with that, just let me know. Write in a podcast at Searles.co. <laughs> Record a video. So I can understand it better and I'll feel, you know, more affect towards you and your brand. One thing in the news this, uh, this month, Meta, uh, you might know them from such applications as, uh, was it Nova, the VPN that you could, uh, get paid to use so that they could scan all of your internet traffic on your phone. Cause, cause Mark Zuckerberg's, you know. I'm not here to kink shame, but that's, that's a real, 
It's a real power power play right there. Uh, they've canceled a, an upcoming product, a 2027 high-end Vision Pro competing, competing, I'll leave it in, competing VR headset. Now, 2027 is so far away. It's like, I'm not sure we're going to have an America in 2027, but okay. All right. It's good to make plans. It's good to have a Gantt chart, I guess. Uh, 2027, apparently they were planning on having something that was like a Vision Pro, and now they are not planning on having something that was like a Vision Pro. And like a Vision Pro probably doesn't mean spec for spec, it's the same sort of thing, and therefore Apple's a few years ahead. It probably means like, you know, vibe-wise, a more professional device that you use uh, to run real apps and get real work done. And by that, I mean just use it to mirror your Mac's (laughs) display. So they canceled that because they're soft demand. And uh, it... It's really interesting, right? Because like they're going the route of buy a gaming company and then kind of keep expanding the games up. And as the hardware gets more powerful, then start moving into productivity software and, and other more useful things, more immersive experiences. And so far, pretty much everything that they've done, whether it's the pass-through video stuff, whether it's the uh, um horizon workrooms right stuff or or like they're kind of like shitty mmo that's not it's like a worse vr chat they've really struggled to get into anything other than basic games Uh, and even the game sales aren't going really well so i i feel for them as a huge vr fan i love vr gaming but i only am really interested in like triple a experiences and those just kind of don't exist so I'm back to thinking that the best way forward for, for VR is uh, commodity headsets plugged into computers or streaming to streaming from gaming PCs and just make it a checkbox. Just make it a bullet point uh, that like build some middleware. Unreal. Build Epic, that is. Build some middleware into Unreal Engine 6 that just has like a single checkbox to turn any game into a VR game with a 15-step wizard and then bada bing bada boom you're playing red dead redemption 3 or gta 6 or whatever in in fully immersive mode that that is the only way i'm gonna get what i want which is like the ability to play games in vr like real games and not like you know just like the kind of shit that passes for games in the quest store uh so yeah i don't know what a uh, what a weird market it's it's never you could compare this to other industries that just seem to have taken fucking forever to get off the ground, like electric cars, I think, right? The electric car, like, fundamentally was very invented for a long, long time. It just took a long time for, like, for, to really have a good experience with an electric car, you basically had to have a computer in the car, and having a computer in a car was hard, much harder than the electric motor. Of course, the batteries weren't strong enough, and I get it. So there's stuff that had to happen. But as a result of that stuff, there was this incongruity or like it wasn't like a um, the evolution of a species where it was kind of iteratively getting closer and closer to the thing. It was like, yeah, so like, hey, we got this electric car and then like everyone involved with it when it went out of business, GM killed it. Sure. But then then a lot of time passed and then some some upstart said, hey, I got an idea. It's an electric car. I almost feel like if it weren't for the fact that we have these two absolutely massive companies and like top 10 biggest companies in the world kind of companies that were still in that kind of phase. They both misjudged it. They both thought that VR had been in that early maturation phase, but we're still basically there. And it's because no one wants to wear fucking ski goggles around their head in a room with other humans. So I don't know. I'm still a huge, I'm going to be the guy just in the vision pro until I, it has to be held together with masking tape because it's so much better for my neck and I, I can see really well and I get... You know what? I was just thinking this morning, like the, this app being feature complete, the design of this app, like it's because in no small part I had the immersive experience of a huge, massive fucking 150-inch equivalent screen um, at a 4K, you know, logical point resolution and I, I, an ability to zoom in really close and like really, really sweat the small stuff as well. Like if I didn't have all that and I was just hunched over my laptop, this app would not be as good. 
like full stop. So not only is it half the cost of like their Apple 6K monitor, which is a fine monitor, but I wouldn't write home about it personally. What about like 32 dimming zones? It's like very out of date at this point. No speaker, come on. Not only is it a really good display and worth it when you compare it to other good displays, but the immersive effect, it, as well as the, uh, the the ability to scale up, scale down, um, you know what you see based on what mode you're in as a computer or user, it. I didn't even realize that the quality of my output would be so much better. I write better. I, my code is clearer. The designs I'm creating are better. So yeah, I'll be, uh, I need pry, you can pry my vision pro from my cold dead hands. I was just thinking like one of the weird things about the vision pro is like, it's never in your hands. It's just kind of dangling off your head. You're just good doing your little pinchy pinch gestures. Uh, another, this is a weird one. I don't normally talk about gaming news in like this kind of mode, but something that I heard about a few days ago and I've been sort of piecing together because I haven't been watching closely. I've been following news very closely at all outside of just politics and whatnot that, you know, the story of this great nation. Uh, so I haven't been following gaming news very much or tech news very much. This game just launched called Black Myth Wukong. I came across little news today when I was uh, scrolling. It, it sold 10 million copies in three days. And I had seen a trailer at like the PlayStation event or something like that in June. And it, it just seemed like a weird fucking thing. It was like, here's a 3D guy who's like a, a he's a human monkey person. And he's doing generic third-person action-adventure combat that looks kind of like a Souls game. And the graphics are fine, but not great. And, like, it's not tied to any real IP, intellectual property that I know of. And it's, like, kind of a dumb monkey man. And you're, like, looking at it, it's like, why? All right, cool. You know, there's not a lot coming out this summer. Maybe it's okay, you know? I knew nothing, right? Later on, I learned it's based on a um, what, 16th century Chinese novel famous in China called Journey to the West is how it's been translated to English folk. And that, that monkey is like, you know, the main character of that story. So I know that now, right? So, oh, okay. So it's based on Chinese uh, myth. And then I saw it like it had it broken the record at launch of the most concurrent uh, players for a single player game on Steam, which I was like, that's a big accomplishment. That's a lot of people. And I, I don't personally keep track of um, what parts of the internet are exist only for the not China people and what parts of the internet China has ready and available access to. But I'd sort of assumed that Steam was like not available in China. What apparently seems to be the case, and this is this became clear as soon as I like started digging in, and I was like, I want to look for this 10 million number on Reddit. And of course, like every single post about this thing in Reddit is a whole bunch of people on Reddit discussing the fact that they throw around 90% or, or 95%, they like a very high percentage of players of this game are in China. Right. So it's a Chinese myth or a Chinese novel, uh, you know, Chinese developer who made the game. And the comments are almost immediately like, so like if, if the question I'm trying to get answered is why did this game sell 10 million in three days? It doesn't seem very good. It doesn't seem very impressive. And of course, like if, if there's a huge cultural touchstone that like some people have with it and I lack, that would explain why I don't see the appeal just from a quick trailer. But you get into the discourse ugh, of gamers ugh, and pretty quickly it's an argument about like, do Chinese gamers count? 
And you're like, what the fuck, man? Like, of course, everybody counts. Absolutely, everybody counts. But then you like, you know, you start digging in. And it's like suddenly some people are pointing out what they claim to be evidence of. Well, actually, it's it. This is less like that many people bought it and are playing it simultaneously, and more like somebody gets a New York Times bestseller because they they know at their publisher that they can just like give a certain amount of money, they buy a certain number of books, and then they get on that list, right? And so then they just have a they have a penthouse full of these books that they got to hand out. And so like people, the allegation being that China's like straw buying a bunch of copies to show off, hey, look, we've got a real AAA Chinese game developer too. Uh, and, and, the, and, or encouraging, you know, people to play on steam in particular for this, you know, to build up excitement and to build up national pride. And so as soon as something becomes sort of like a political, like, like a nationalist, like, you know, uh, propaganda campaign. Okay. I see that a little bit differently. I could see how people would feel like, you know, whatever but like it would definitely take a little bit of the edge off the whoa 10 million that's so impressive and i'm going to uncritically look at that like every single article that i saw about the just the raw numbers like 10 million that's really impressive well if i mean like you know if the people's republic is uh buying two-thirds of them and then handing them out as steam codes or whatever like that's i don't know is that i guess a centrally planned economy like that's one way to goose sales that's totally fine <laughs> but anyway that you, you keep digging and you try to find like, where's the, where's the good side in this story? Cause like, I don't, I'm not, I, I don't like the people who are just saying like, oh, well they're Chinese gamers. It doesn't count. Or it's a Chinese game developer. It doesn't count. It's not a real game or reviews of it. Aren't particularly like amazing. It's, it seems like it doesn't seem like a bad game. It doesn't seem like a good game. It seems like a very mediocre. It's a, one of those. It's if you like the souls, like things it seems fine. It seems like it's got a lot of performance issues on PC, whatever. I don't know. But the deeper you dig, it's just like, there's no good guys. <laughs> the um, next story that pulls up in this Black Myth Wukong uh, uh, legend, I guess there's the legend from the 16th century and how quickly it's becoming a legend now because the number of articles that like, like, like how deep this rabbit hole seems to go. So apparently like they contracted the, 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 the game dev is called uh, game science. I think they contracted with, I think a European publicist to get streamers and influencers to promote the game. So here's a, here's a code for the game, like a retail code, uh, not a pre-release code, just like a, we'll give you a free copy of the game if you go stream it. But they were warned as like a condition on that free code. You know, to what extent any of this shit is ever a contract and whatever it is, is sort of like you, if you get free shit from a gaming company, and I used to get free shit from gaming companies when I was in high school and I was doing this shit. You just suck up. And if they tell you not to do something, you don't do it. Not because you'll get sued, but because they'll stop giving you free shit if they get mad at you. And that, that, you know, that tension would, especially for small outlets, like the one where I was writing would be enough to inflate review scores. Cause like we wouldn't want to get iced out of pre-release copies of games. So if I wanted to give something a six, my, 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 my friends would be like, Hey, you know, you give them a six, we might not get that, the big blockbuster game this fall early, which sucks. Right. But influencers, right. Especially if you're paying for like a promoted stream, like you want some famous Twitch person to, to, to do the game, uh, you might be paying the money. Right. So the, that, that might've been involved here too. Like the, these might've been promoted streams, but anyway, the direct quote of what the writer told people that they couldn't do. Don't include, it's a do not include politics, violence, nudity. Okay, 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 reasonable. Feminist propaganda. All right. <laughs> Fetishization and other content that instigates negative discourse. Don't use that stuff in your content when you're streaming this. It also separately said, don't use trigger words such as quarantine, isolation, or COVID-19. And uh, I don't know how, you know, if this was a writer that they just copy paste for like this particular publicist for every single game or if they still feel like the word quarantine is a trigger word or what it might have fucking have to do with. It seems like this is a list of stuff that China might be interested in not having you associate with a Chinese game developer, I guess. Uh, and it also wasn't clear whether this was targeted. These writers were targeted at um, 
streamers and influencers inside of China. At least I heard some of that. It was like, well, if they're in English, I one one assumes that this is for, you know, other markets. And then it said, furthermore, streamers were uh, asked not to discuss anything about China's game industry policies, opinions, or news. So now it's start, starting to feel like, you know, um, what was just a kind of mediocre third-person action-adventure game is now, like, random influencers on Twitch are, are, are basically mini Bob Igers trying to navigate the Chinese, like, you know, theater market to try to figure out how to get the next Marvel movie in there. Well, we got to make this Shang-Chi movie, I guess. I don't even think that worked. I don't even think that one got in. Anyway, so that's... I thought that would be it. I'm mean, like, all right, well, you know, it's, it, it's, it's awkward, right? Cause like China's trying to gain international cultural relevance and in, in pop culture, gaming being one of them, you know, they have 10 cent, they, they have 10 cent buy up a whole bunch of gaming companies. They invest in Epic big, they buy all or most of riot games that makes, you know, uh, Valorant and league of legends. Like, so they're, they're, they're trying to establish cultural relevance and buying Western creatives, is maybe a good investment strategy, but doesn't really move the needle on how people feel about your nation. But having a, a domestic game company that had previously only made mobile games make a AAA game and have that be a big hit and be able to break it, sold 10 million copies in three days. Look at me, that's one of the biggest ones this year. And then to have that associated with China, like that's all like, you know, that's a jingoist wet dream. That's great from their perspective. And, but, but, you know, you can't necessarily break every habit all at once. It's like, oh, but also, you know, like we still got a very, very narrow, uh, narrow range of what we consider to be in balance. And so that, that friction of where their culture interacts with our culture for the purpose of promoting their culture, like, I think that's just interesting, right? I love to see the back and forth here. I like it when stories don't have a clear, like, it's not about... Uh, good side, bad side. It's like, oh, wow, this is layers, right? And you dig down the layers. Well, unfortunately, I kept digging. <laughs> and as I scrolled uh, down, I searched for, for, for like, oh, what's this game science company about? So, oh, it was like, it was uh, forked off another company because of these disagreements. And it turns out one of the people at the company, one of the founders, is like just real horny and just like has these really long Weibo posts of, you know, like, uh, um, uh, you know, of course, this is all in Chinese, but the translations are like, you know, like I won't characterize what I read, but they're they are horny, they are inappropriate, they are workplace harassy enough uh, that at least you know Chinese women gamers have once they saw this stuff, they they're like, oh yeah, I used to play their games or whatever, but I don't. You know, so so clearly it's like domestically in China, like the sexism is like seen as a problem. And you keep, and there's this other uh, co-founder. He uh, apparently went on this huge diatribe about how games uh, are made, that, that are made for women and men are completely different due to, to their biological differences. And he, he uh, I'm quoting from this IGN summary. He pointed out that when men, quote, were holding a heavy machine gun and shooting at governments in your dreams, what the ladies are dreaming about are bags that would make their friends jealous. So, cool. So anyway, if you're playing Black Myth Wukong, shout out. I haven't tried it yet because I'm, I'm just not going to do that because it seems mediocre and I don't like those kinds of games. But if you're playing it, let, write in. Podcast at Searles.co. Tell me what you think. I'll read it. On, on air. Uh, and I won't, I won't, I'm not calling, I won't call you a sexist or something, right? Like it's, uh, you can separate the, the art from the artist to, to a large extent. Uh, but this definitely is probably not the PR that, that, that President Xi, 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 I don't, I don't say his name a lot whatever it's not the pr situation that china was probably hoping for with this thing so yeah uh the the western hegemony and i guess western slash japanese hegemony of the gaming industry in terms of culture continues uh apace it seems for now but it's interesting to see 
other economic powers start to, to break in. And, and you've seen that through, uh, 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 through other, you know, the Middle East as well, like the Saudi fund, uh, uh, was going to buy, was it uh, Devolver? And uh, then pulled out at the last minute and then Devolver fell apart. And now like all these publishers closed because like they were really banking on that. So yeah, it's, it's interesting to see other, other uh, nations try to, try to break in that way. Um, hmm. Yeah, right, right in if you play it. Uh, only other news item here is uh, uh, about Ford, my favorite automaker, because I've only ever bought Fords. Uh, I've only ever really driven Fords. And the reason is that my grandfather worked at Ford. He was an, he was an engineer and designer. And this is an article in The Atlantic. And of course, like it opens... So it's called the hardest sell in American car culture. It opens explaining that Ford in 2018 and then quickly followed by the other um, big three American automakers, they basically stopped selling sedans. They stopped selling cars and everything now is classified as a light truck, like an SUV. And this article misses why that happened. Of course it happened because they're popular, but like the car companies are the ones marketing and making the stuff. They're the thing. They're the people who makes shit popular. Like what happened was, and you can see it from like, I, I, I think uh, I was looking up these dates earlier, like the cafe standards when those got, uh, you know, notched up, you know, like in, uh, what was it? Cars had to have 26 or 27 and a half miles per gallon and, and, and light trucks could have 22 and those stayed stagnant for a long time. But then they in, it, gradually over the, in like 2000s, 2007, like they were put on a schedule that they'd both increase at a proportional rate. Uh, and then in the 2010s, it went up even higher. And so now like the, the, if you're building a car, something that is legally car sized with like the dimensions and stuff, you have to hit like 36.9 or whatever miles per gallon on track for like 55 or whatever. But because it's based on percentage increase over, you know, year over year, and it, because of the compounding effect, light utility trucks and SUVs are starting at a much lower number of their miles per gallon, their emission standards. And so the car makes by eliminating sedans from their lineup, either in part or entirely, the big reason why we got so many SUVs wasn't just because SUVs were popular. It was because they could get away with not having to do the engineering work and the manufacturing and the retooling to get emission standards up to snuff. So it's like, a, it's an end run to be like, oh, well, the nation thinks it's passing this regulation or, or California is passing this regulation thinking that it's going to result in more fuel efficient vehicles. But because you've got this loophole of, well, anything that's big enough and wide enough to be considered a truck, like an SUV platform, uh, we'll just make all those because it's way lower, you know, we're going to go the path of least resistance here and we're just going to do all trucks. Oops, oops, all trucks. And uh, that way we don't have to hit any of those fuel standards. So that was how we got here, right? That's how a, how the world became every single, uh, every single car just looks like the same angry minivan now. A bulbous SUV thing, like a station wagon with just, you know, junk in the trunk. And... Like in my neighborhood, right? Like there's a, I, I drive a, a black Ford Escape. In my neighborhood, there are 20 other black SUVs that I see all the time. One of them is an, a black Alfa Romeo. I see a black Maserati. I see a black, uh, 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 of course, a uh, Porsche. Um, oh yeah, and there's a black Ferrari too. And you know what? Gun to head, if they were all parked next to each other in the parking lot, I'd still have to hit the fucking clicker on my fob to know which one was mine because they all look the same fucking car. Like, I sure hope they have as good of a car play as my Ford Escape does, but I somehow doubt it, even though my thing cost one-seventh that theirs did, if that. Ugh. So anyway, me personally, not a big fan of SUVs, especially because I'm mostly just driving to restaurants back and forth forever. Uh, I don't need to load up. I'm usually by myself or with Becky. This article is interesting because it points to a moment in time that we're at an inflection point because what, what had been, if we only sell SUVs and we sell them at really high margins and then kind of keep chasing up that, like 
now, now, you know, that's how they're selling the $90,000 F-150s and they're making a lot of money and the profits look really good. But because the SUV platform is way heavier, your bigger vehicles, then you need bigger batteries, which are also much more expensive to be able to get the range that Americans expect, especially if they're looking at a big vehicle. Because if I'm looking at a gigantic fucking truck, I'm like, yeah, that should go like 400 miles. But like, if in reality, a much lighter car with even like a lighter battery, right? Like the, the scaling factor is not completely linear. If I look at like a Honda, Honda Leaf or something, a Nissan Leaf, I'm like, oh yeah, like, no, that's a much smaller car, but it can actually go further than the really big truck. You know, that that would not compute in our like little tiny pea brain, American sized brains. So like instead, we, <laughs> uh, instead, all of the auto makes and Ford included are putting these massive fucking batteries in these already massive vehicles to the point where it's like, you know, the secondary concern is like all of our highways are going to become, you know, run down because not only do electric vehicles typically not pay gas taxes, which is the primary way that we fund maintenance on roads. But like, it's like, it's like if everything was like 10 times as heavy, then like, you know, roads wear down faster because they're just not, it's not like you make a road and then you're done forever. But now we're at this inflection point, this beautiful moment where because selling the car that we only made big so we could skimp on emission standards and fuel efficiency standards uh, is now way more expensive and the margins are way tighter. And so Ford just canceled, uh, you know, what would, looks like a, you know, a three row uh, uh, SUV like the Expedition or something. And they canceled the project because the it wouldn't have on a, on a per unit basis, it wouldn't have turned a profit in the first 12 months. Like, and now Jim Farley at CEO of Ford is like, we've got to make Americans fall in love with the car again because of this weight problem. And so, you know, trying to regulate your way into like getting companies to do what you want is really tricky because there are loopholes and like, you know, trying to get anyone to do something that they don't want to do by setting a rules. Like, yeah, that's really hard. But now that the incentives seem to be aligned, for these automakers to go back to just making fucking cars that are small and efficient and not super wasteful. That is music to my ears. So I am very happy uh, about that. I hope to buy a car again someday. We'll see. See how many years it takes uh, for us to get to get to that point. But thus concludes, that's all the stories I pulled. I, you know, like I said, I haven't followed news very much. If you've got a story that you want me to talk about on the podcast, feel free, write in podcast at and then I'm going to make you guess the domain name because I've said it enough already. God damn it. Well, since we're already talking about mediocre content that nevertheless created way more excitement uh, on the internet than, than the, uh, the medium in which it was actually released, some recommendations. I, uh, I watched the acolyte. Uh, I finished it the night before Disney canceled it. Uh, I finished it first. It, it's a star Wars program. It tells a story about the high Republic, which, you know, because Disney is too chicken shit to actually advance the timeline beyond the end of the last terrible rise of Skywalker film. Uh, they have created a whole playground of not the old Republic, but the in between the old Republic and the, you know, original trilogy. I prefer extra crispy Star Wars, but well, I'm not getting that either. So Disney Plus series called The Acolyte. Maybe you've heard of it. Maybe you watched it. I, if you have, I'd be curious to know what you actually thought. I thought it was mediocre and fine. And it was a thing that I had on a TV while I played a video game. And for that purpose, it did a good job. It was, you know, did I notice that there were non-white Jedis? Yes, I did. Did I notice that there was uh, non-straight people portrayed? in complicated, you know, situations. Did it paint the Jedis as not always, I'm saying Jedis here intentionally. Did it paint those Jedis as not necessarily like good, just righteous, but, but also highly political and, and self, you know, self-serving like, yes, it had a much more kind of nuanced view of, of all them Jedis. And I appreciate I don't know. It's all fine. But the story was kind of like, meh. 
and uh, the acting was kind of eh. it, like, it was it was it was worth watching. Like a lot of the Disney streaming stuff has been worth watching if you've got nothing better to do. Which, admittedly, that's kind of my thing. I don't have anything better to do because once once I hit like nine p.m., my brain's no good for anything else but playing stupid video games and watching shows. And uh, because I'm afraid of sleep, I'm, I'm not going to go to bed until I'm like ready to pass out. So I got some, I got to have something to do. So anyway, it's that uh, it got canceled. I'm going to share another uh, Wired article because it online, this thing got, r- well, they, we use the phrase review bomb to mean like there's a campaign of like concerted Reddit 4chan, everyone be like, there's a woman in this. We got to go and say it's zero stars, right? Like, I don't think it's quite that. I think it's that like, you know, Star Wars fans have been very clear in expressing what they want out of the franchise. And then Disney is doing something else and they are increasingly agitated and angry. And sometimes they are just, you know, they will facially be like, yes, I watched this and I didn't love it very much. But they're also like, I think there's an advocacy and sort of a camaraderie among the people who are miserable about where Star Wars is. And so that whether it is literally a campaign to review bomb the Rotten Tomato score of a streaming show, or if it's just what people feel is their only outlet for, for making their views known to Kathleen Kennedy and the other star folk. I don't know. Couldn't tell you. Uh, I think that mediocre TV is fine. And I think star Wars doesn't matter very much. And those are the very strong opinions that you came (laughs) that you get on a program like this one, I suppose. I, I, why can't y'all be normal? The, the people that I hear getting really mad about this Star Wars show or any Star Wars show or thing, uh, you did Luke wrong or whatever. Like they, I think I see in them future HOA board members, uh, based on what I'm seeing on Facebook. Got a, 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 Successful career in local government. Uh, uh, other stuff. Started watching Curb Your Enthusiasm. Um, never watched it. Went back to season one. I don't know if if you're a Curb curb head. If you're a Curb fan, I don't know if that's like where people would recommend starting, but I just did. People have often told me that I have a certain Larry David-like quality of being a shit heel, uh, which is I appreciate. And I can see the resemblance um hmm. he looks a lot older than he is at every step and that's that's at times been true of me too i he complains a lot i i also complain a lot and he tries to be funny about how he complains he, he makes it his soul shtick and yeah i i get it trust me but i so what I think he's a genius at is uh, just from watching the four, first four episodes of this show, I think Larry David is a genius at um, creating tension and releasing tension in comedy. Because like that's a big, big part of it. The problem is if all you're doing is pulling back a um, like an exercise, like a fitness band, and you're pulling it back to the point of tension, to the point of like, ah, that really hurts, that burns, is it going to snap? I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Um, when you pull it back that hard and then you release the tension, it's, it's not necessarily enjoyable unless the content of it was, had some redeeming quality, unless like the, there's an endearing character, there's a, a story that like you'll think about it later or you'll want to reference it later and tell somebody else. Because even like, you know, like it's not about being off-putting because I think like, I think you should leave with um, uh, Tim Robinson is incredibly off-putting. It goes out of its way to be a will make you uncomfortable by just how weird this guy is. But the stories that he tells are like meant to be like, no, he's just quirky. Like he's misunderstood. He's quirky. Yes, he's maybe not a great guy or whatever. Like, but like, from sketch to sketch, the composite image that you take away makes you want to quote it because there's something about the sloppy steaks sketch or whatever it is that, that, that is 
in retrospect, it makes you like, ah, oh, yeah. But it can, it can definitely be a little cringy to watch it. Whereas like, <sighs> my first impressions of Curb Your Enthusiasm is like, I, like, I feel very tense. I feel like, yes, the tension is built. I feel it in my shoulders. And then when it's, when it's relieved, my mouth sometimes made laughing sounds and I was by myself. I know that's rare. It, it was like a chuckle, like exerted, like it, 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 it emitted from me. <laughs> but it wasn't like an active laugh. It was like a release. It was like a, huh, almost like an exhale. And I, I caught myself continuing to do that. And I just realized like, I don't, none of this has any redeeming anything. It's just like, it's just suffering. It's like, it feels less like arrested development or I even, I think you should leave and more like what it would probably feel like to, you know, uh, be waterboarded where it's like, Oh God, I'm, I'm being waterboarded. Oh, the water in my, you know, it's like, I'm feel like I'm dying. I'm dry. I feel like I'm drowning. I can't stop. And then, and then Larry David picks you up out of the water and then you get a few seconds to be like, ah, 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 and it dunks you again. Right? Like it feels way more like experientially in my skin trying to watch the show. I was like, why? Like maybe some people just have a higher tolerance for discomfort than I do. I, I reference waterboarding, not because I think I'd last 15 fucking seconds if I got waterboarded, but because, you know, I, for me, if I was talking to a bunch of other Justin Searles, I could have just said, it's like having to stand outside in grass without socks on and you can feel the grass, you know, on your feet. Cause to me, that's the equivalent torture, right? I've got a very low threshold for discomfort <laughs> and, uh, dare you not ever see me cross it. But then again, that's where a lot of my content comes from, I suppose. Uh, other stuff, recommendations, a smart less, something I actually would recommend smart less, which, uh, speaking of arrest development, Will Arnett and Jason Bateman, and then Sean, I want to say the guy from Will and Grace. Uh, they've got a podcast. Uh, it's, you know, maybe you've heard about it. I don't know. It's a, a interview show. And the, the, the conceit of the show is that, uh, each episode, one of them picks a guest and the other two don't know who the guest is until the guest reveals themselves, you know, and comes on the show. It's like, Oh my God, it's Obama or Oprah or whatever. Um, this documentary is on max. It's on HBO and it's a COVID era tour that they did. And I thought it was really good. It was good because like, I think especially if you've seen Arrested Development, seeing Bateman and Will Arnett together uh, is entertaining. It's, uh, you have a probably a certain affect for those two and they're clearly like best friends. They're really tight. But they, they bicker a lot like brothers and it's, and it's, it's the way that only comedians who are, have that kind of competitive, like trying to get the better bit out over on somebody way. It's just like a, a, there's a harder edge to it where maybe they don't feel those things, but I don't know. Most comedians that I've met, like there's something dark inside of them too. So I wouldn't assume necessarily that just cause they laugh after it, like what you said didn't hurt them. So the, the bickering and stuff that got old with me quickly, but like there were it again, in terms of contrast, like there were so many moments where they would have these really kind of deep and thoughtful conversations while traveling on the road, but while doing this uh, tour for these podcast shows. Uh, additionally, it was interesting watching, you know, there you pick up more when there's video of like how somebody works with an, with a, an informal interview guest who isn't necessarily a professional, like a talk show host. Uh, yeah, it's worth watching again. Great way to pass time. I, I'm not sure that I'd ever, uh, sit and watch it and not be playing a video game. But that, that applies to a lot of things. Apparently speaking of video games, I'm kind of between stuff right now. I want to play the new star Wars outlaws, but it, it doesn't uh, get into this like pre-release phase until like August 27th. I kind of tapped out on what I was playing a week earlier. So I've been just rolling the dice and trying different stuff and, and seeing if there's anything new that I like. I've not tried black myth Wukong. Thank you for asking. Uh, I did try death loop by arcane Leon. Um, our, the studio Arcane, their Leon office, which now we don't have to say because uh, Microsoft closed the Austin office, so now it's just the only Arcane left. The, they're the ones who made Deathloop, and Deathloop is a time loop game where you play a guy named Colt, 
and you don't know what's going on and you're trying to, all you know is you're supposed to break this time loop and there's this lady who you think you might have been, you know, romantically involved with at some point, but she keeps killing you. And then you wake up and then she kills you again. And you're like, ah, oh, man, okay. And the time loop stuff is always fun because it's like it gives an in-universe reason for doing the same thing over and over again. Whereas most video games is like, oh, you died. You want to retry? But like the game itself isn't aware. There's no fourth wall. There's no like, it's just like, it's literally like we had a time machine, but we don't, we, we all just don't talk about it. It's called the continue button. Don't, don't think too hard about it. So I think time loop games when executed well and the story uh, calls for it and the, and the mechanics reinforce it, uh, they can be really effective. I think uh, the Forgotten City Actually, uh, Mike McQuaid, a uh, uh, friend of the show, the homebrew maintainer fellow, <laughs> he recommended I play Forgotten City when I was talking about like, oh man, I, I, I love Roman stuff. Yeah, I would love more Rome themed stuff. So, so yeah, it's Forgotten City is a great time loop game. I, I played it when it uh, was still new and uh, you kind of use that. It uses that time loop for you to, through many, many iterations and many conversations and then knowing the exact timing of uh, uh, places like and, and people to talk to uh, to ultimately unwind a mystery. Uh, I think it's very effective. Uh, and Deathloop tries to be that for a stealth action shooter game. Uh, very cool style, very cool music, very mid-century modern motif. So if you, if you, if, if all that stuff sounds interesting to you, definitely try out Deathloop. It's on Game Pass. I just found myself. Uh, generally whenever it's not feasible to just run and gun my way through a shooter if if like a game like dishonored where you really get punished either through like having a bunch of reinforcements come uh like every time you like you know trip it, trip an alarm and you just start killing people it's like if you have an infinite number of bad guys spawning to try to like train you to not do that i i hate that like i I'm bad at stealth. I don't want to think about stealth. I don't want to sit in a corner and wait for somebody to finish the conversation and walk away. Like, fuck that. I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm insufficiently fascinated by like, you know, just like the world building of a place that I'm going to sit there, watch two NPCs have a conversation I don't care about so that I can go and walk behind them. No, like I'm just going to try to walk through and hope they don't notice me, but then they notice me. So I shoot them. And then there's like a infinite number of bad guys until like what I run away or restart. So anyway, it's stealth mechanics are not super optional as far as I can tell, because if you just run and gun everyone, you just get infinite bad guys. So if you've played death loop and that's wrong, please let me know. I even turned on the accessibility setting that like everything's a one shot kill. And it was still too much because it was, uh, the controls aren't, I didn't love the, the gamepad controls. Maybe it's easier on mouse and keyboard. So Deathloop, that's a recommendation. If that sounds like that's up your alley, it might not be up mine. I also played a game called Atlas Fallen, colon, Reign of Sand. And it's like an open world world game. And uh, it's on Game Pass. I think it just came to Game Pass. And you know what? It's I've been talking enough about this. I, I don't know. Don't play it. I mean, play it. Eh, don't play it. That's a pass. I never just say like straight up. This is look, if something's that's the hardest, right? If something's bad, if something's like objectionably, just do not give this thing money or time. That's easy. If something's great and it's just like you, everyone needs to experience this. Hey, mom, I know you don't, you know, you're, 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 you're not into this genre of video game, but like, you got to play this mom. That's easy. If something's like, uh, not, it's not that it's a close call. It's that you don't want to shit on something that somebody worked on and you, and you know that out there, there are five people who would really take to this thing, but just statistically the probability that like you listener would like to play this video game called Atlas Fallen. It's low enough that the right thing for me to do is say, don't, don't, don't play it. Instead of saying like 95% of you would try this, get through the tutorial and then fall off immediately because it's just kind of too samey and 5% of you sickos would just love it. So I don't know. Uh, I, I guess I'll just have to wait the two days remaining until the new uh, Star Wars uh, open world game from Ubisoft Star Wars Outlaws. You play as a 
a uh, new mercenary character in the kind of original trilogy ish time frame. Uh, that mercenary character is a woman, so I can't wait until till I hear about what the internet thinks. Uh, but she's got a cute little uh, alien pet that she can use to run run interference and cause distractions. Uh, yeah, it looks good. We'll see see what reviews look like. But like, if you buy the Ubisoft Ubisoft, I, see, I, I know they call themselves Ubisoft, but I've always been I've called them Ubisoft since middle school. Um. And it doesn't look like a French word, even though I know they're French. Uh, if you buy the fourteen ninety nine a month, whatever Ubisoft subscription service, you get this game access to this game early and for free, and with the extra bonus content. Or I can pay sixty or seventy dollars for it. So you're like, well, as long as you're, so many of these subscription services really are predicated on you being too lazy or having too much loss aversion to unsubscribe from them. Like, I don't see myself spending more than four months on this game. And if I do, then it is worth the 15 bucks a month, right? Um, so I'll probably, ugh, I hate signing up for another subscription, but like, I'll probably just sign up and then immediately do the, uh, you know, the whole dance. You, you sign up for a new subscription, you go to a managed account, and then you immediately cancel. And it's like, are you sure you want to cancel? And then you know that they're going to not prorate a refund. They're going to leave your access up for a month. Yes, I want to cancel. It's like, oh, yo, you can't, are you sure you're going to lose this and this and this and this and this? Yes, yes, I'm sure. It's like, oh, do you want to contact cut customer support? No, I don't. Like, and you finally get to the very end. It's like, okay, well, you're canceled now. And that means you only have access for another 30 fucking days. Thank you. All right. Uh, uh, yeah. So other stuff, you know, I'm looking for that Star Wars game. There, uh, I love Deadpool and Wolverine, but so did the rest of America. So I don't have to say anything else about that. Uh, I wanted to, uh, uh, go out and see alien Romulus Remus alien, the new alien, but the reviews were pretty meh, and no one wanted to go with me. So I guess I'll just sit tight and uh, catch that one at home. Movie stuff. All right, I guess the well runneth dry, and that's time to move on. You've got mail. Time for some mail. Um, Jesse asks, why are ISPs so bad? What is there to do about it? Well, Jesse, coincidental timing that I suddenly have hope. Uh, if you if you are in the U.S. and you search for FCC complaint broadband, then you can actually do something about it because apparently whatever public record list of complaints that, that gets published by the FCC or whatever fines they get for not responding to these complaints must be serious enough that they take people seriously, at least a spectrum. So there's something you can do about it. I think, look, if... If the way that everyone got wine, imagine that everyone who drinks wine in the whole country, everyone who drinks wine, they, the only way you could get it is a subscription service with like a local wine distributor. You don't get to pick the distributor. Every, every city might have one or maybe two. And so like you can pick between them and you can, you can pay, you know, uh, let's say call it uh, 20 bucks for one bottle a month. Uh, uh, 40 bucks for two or four bottles or whatever. So there's a few tiers, but you can only get that like, you know, one four pack of maybe up to eight. But like, if you want more than eight bottles, sorry, Charlie, we only sell you packages up to eight. Uh, you know, you would be upset. You'd be like, well, I want to be able to buy more wine. And we'd be like, oh, sorry, this is how wine works. And additionally, now, now imagine Jesse that you are, uh, you're not just a normal wine drinker. You are a, a aficionado. You love a good cab. You really, really care about the provenance of your wine. And you want to be able to get a particular kind of wine, but that distributor doesn't have it. Or you you think that the wine that they have is swill and it's not very good. For for, for qualitative and, and, and real reasons that you can see, but that they apparently don't care about and which very unfortunately for you, none of their other customers care about either. That's, uh, that's what ISPs are. 
you're probably a techie person. You probably want fast speeds. You probably want low latency. You probably don't want to be able to run traceroute and then see your request bounce across 15 different nodes in a goddamn circle before they finally escape your, your ISP's infrastructure and go out to the big bad internet. Uh, you probably don't want to have, you know, connectivity just like drop out at random times of day or have inbound traffic to your IP address blocked at random on and off for no fucking reason or certain ports to just be inaccessible, right? You probably wouldn't want those things because you're a technical person, but like would 98% of America ever notice any of those things ever? No, they wouldn't. They'd just be like, huh, the Netflix is slow. Must be, must be weather, right? That's what we're talking about here, right? So uh, that's why they're bad. <laughs> and what you can do about it is find inner peace. Go read a book about how to stop giving a fuck. Get some uh, cognitive behavioral therapy at a, at a, at a reputable therapist. Uh, uh, find, find a medication that'll help you cope with your existence or move the fuck out. Those are kind of all of your non-FCC complaint options. Uh, in my estimation. Thank you, Jesse. Appreciate your writing in. Uh, reading the next one, I have lost all context in what this is about. Uh, I'm going to skip this one. Jason Carnes. <laughs> It's only Jason. It's only Jason. Uh, this is the second time I've done it. I read an email. I always say the first name because I don't know how uh, personal it's going to be. But in my brain, because I've known Jason for so long and I knew him at a time when I knew a lot of Jasons, that his name is not Jason. His name is Jason Carnes. And whenever I did say Jason, he would sometimes chide me that it sounds too much like how I say Jason, the uh, the data format. Jasons in tech do not like it when you pronounce their name the same way that you pronounce that file extension. So Jason Carnes, uh, sorry, Jason, wants to know how I use Apple Photos. So he, he's, he's been chatting about, you know, he's, he's moving off Google Cloud for unrelated reasons, then they might identify something as CSAM and then ban his Google account forever. He's moving on to Apple Photos. He's got a bunch of questions, bunch of questions about how I use Apple Photos. I've, I'm on a like eight terabyte or 12 terabyte, whatever the maxed out like iCloud plan is because we have literally five terabytes in, in, in photos. It's disgusting. Uh, do you, you, question one, do you use shared library? Answer, yes. With who? Uh, Becky, just me and Becky. Uh... How has that impacted the way you manage photos? It has impacted it mostly negatively. <laughs> it is really nice because we're usually together. Um, and all it has done, it has eliminated it, So it's done one thing passively and one thing actively. Like the passive thing that it's done is it's uh, sometimes I see pictures that I otherwise wouldn't see because Becky happened to take them with her phone and I was out with her and the system correctly identified that it should be auto added to the shared library instead of the personal library. So that passively is like, oh yeah, we're just getting more pictures. Like I am in some pictures in my own library, right? Without having to go and receive them proactively from somebody else. The active thing that it does is uh, it, it, in the sense that I used to have to either proactively share stuff or be asked for stuff, right? She would ask me, send me those photos from last night because maybe my phone has a slightly better camera. And then I'd have the chore of having to go and find the photos. At least between the two of us, that no longer happens. And that is very nice. But like what sucks about it is you can never say, you know, Apple only wants to cause so many divorces because of technology. You can't tell it, put every single photo into the shared library, no matter what. Only use these heuristics like Bluetooth proximity, are you at home, you know, that kind of thing, which results in a bunch of pictures that you really logically would want to be in your shared library being in the personal library. And now you have a new chore, which is like a monthly sweep that you do where you can only really easily do this from a Mac is like have a smart album set up of all the individual library photos that are like not in another. So what I, I set up a folder, right? So I got like a folder in my, um, a smart, smart 
uh, playlist or smart album. Yeah, smart album that will say, show me all the stuff from my personal library that is not a screenshot, that is not a XYZ, and that is not in this other album that I maintain called intentionally personal, right? Because if you just select every single, if you really truly wanted zero personal images, it would be very easy. You just regularly select all and then mark them all as the shared library, move them to shared library. But if there's some that you want to keep personal, then I have this album and uh, where I put those intentionally personal ones, it's mostly just stuff that Becky would not want to see. Get your mind out of the gutter. Uh, and the smart album's job then is to exclude those ones so I don't accidentally just like, you know, shoot up all of the uh, intentionally personal ones into the share. I don't know if I'm explaining this well. It's... You know, it's just another chore to do. And then, of course, I had to go do that on her Mac and kind of sort of teach her how to do it. But, of course, like, who's... Hmm, it's a mess. Uh, how do I do backups? I have... Uh, I keep buying a, uh, the biggest solid-state disk that Apple will sell. So I've got a Mac Studio with 8 terabytes on it, and it's almost fucking full, which is frustrating, so that I can have the I, iCloud... The Apple Photos not with the optimized storage turned on, but, like, fully download to this computer. And then I use Backblaze to back this computer up. And even though I've got a Synology in the house, I have not found a single way to back up my Mac to that Synology in a reliable way that doesn't suck up a lot of resources and doesn't fail after a month or two. So I just have the Backblaze right now. Backblaze, I suppose, as well as the iCloud syncing. How do you order prints? I don't order prints. I've been thinking about ordering prints. How do you order prints? I don't know. I want to hang up some photos in the walls. Uh, we've got pretty barren walls here by up until now by choice, but you know, be nice to see some friendly faces every now and then. What non-phone devices connect to your library? Do you use it on Apple TV? Fancy digital frames? Now, Jason's got kids, so he's more excited about some of this stuff. Um, phone, all the Apple stuff, right? Phone, iPad, Mac. Um, yeah, sure. It's on the Apple TV, but that thing sucks at syncing. So you, you get, you'll see stuff sometimes. Uh... I, real boring. You know what I'll say is on iOS and iPad OS, it's real like the home screen has come to lose a lot of meaning because we got the app library. It's really easy to search for an apps and stuff. So I really like the featured photo widget because I would never think to look at my photos except for that. I'm on the home screen anyway. I'm about to go do something. It's like, it's like having a banner ad for your life. <laughs> oh yeah, I remember that trip. Oh yeah, I remember having that much hair. Oh, I'll click that, right? Except uh, it's free. So that's the primary way that I consume photos and videos. How do I organize my albums? Yeah, I used to, I used to do this. And now like the number of photos taken every year is just so much. Like I don't bother with albums anymore, particular events. I am, I'm eager for the AI search to get better and better. And for Apple to continue. There's a reason Apple is working so hard to try to organize our photos for us is because they know no one does this. Functionally, nobody does this. And really, from a UI perspective, you need to be on a Mac to even have a chance in hell because smart albums somehow still don't even work on their mobile platforms. How do you use folders? I basically use folders um, whenever the sidebar gets too full. I hide stuff in folders. Uh, but then, of course, if, if your albums are in folders, they don't show up right in the phone. So that's fun. Uh, smart albums have you created? I create them for um, pairs of people or groups of people. Show me all pictures that have exactly my me, my brother, and my dad, right? Like I, uh, um, I did that for a retirement gift for him um, where I, want, I wanted to have a picture of the three of us, for example. So usually it's like, well, I know if it's like got these this set of people in it, that'll at least be a good launching off point because every time that we've hung out, this set of people has been in a picture. Uh, and then Jason asked, whatever else I'm uh, teach me? I, hmm... I think passively managing it is how Apple wants you to use it. So you may as well start that way. Just import everything, take a bunch of pictures and it's like, let, let it ride. You, you know, they're safe. You know, they're there. You can always go back and spend an entire weekend organizing stuff. If you want, I would, I would be not too precious about it. Uh, Cause I would not be surprised if like albums or smart albums just kind of went away in favor of Apple intelligence at some point. 
Uh, clearly, the reason why smart albums aren't everywhere is because they don't want to deal with um, supporting that feature. Uh, all right. Um, we got Adam writing in. Adam, whose last name I will not write. Well, okay. I'm going to link to his thing, so I guess I will. His name is Adam McCray. He's also a friend. Uh, fantastic developer. He makes a, uh, an application uh, called Judo Scale that helps with auto scaling your app. And he showed off a screencast of, because uh, he saw one of my blog posts or podcasts about um, using declarative HTML to, to design apps using uh, instead of traditional CSS files and JS files and stuff. Uh, so I'm going to share the screencast. Uh, he uses Alpine instead of Stimulus and thinks it's better at encoding behavior into HTML without needing to extract JavaScript. Uh, but he admits it's a bit of tomato, tomato. This is all me very obviously paraphrasing. Sorry, Adam, for butchering your words. Um, I go a bit further using flex with a PH instead of ERB, because not only do I want all my styling and behavior to be encoded into my HTML, I also want all of my related HTML in a single source file and doesn't want to jump between partials and helpers. That's all nice. You know, it's like in little Ruby files and private methods. Um, but also still using Tailwind. It's, I'll link to the screencast. You'll get a chance to take a tour with Adam of like how he's organized things. For me, there is a tremendous amount of value of staying on the vanilla Omakase standard stack where I don't care too much. Uh, if it's good enough, then that provides a lot for me. It means like, uh, forward compatibility upgrades will not be broken if I do everything the way that the framework tells me to. And stimulus is kind of the golden path and Alpine is a thing I haven't heard of. Just like ERB is the golden path and flex is a thing that I don't think I'd heard of. So they're cool to see and find out. And if anything, I damn my eyes when I see them because the worst thing that could happen is I could, uh, the part of me that's a perfectionist or that really is always pursuing the best design would see that and be like, ah, yes, that is 20% better. And then I'd switch to it for that betterness. But developer Justin and maintainer Justin are like two different modes of thought because yes, it might be 20% better as code, as produce, like either the act of writing the code or reading the code. But if it if it's also 30% harder to keep this system running and upgraded, or if it's, you know, or, or and as a result, like, like a relatedly harder to maintain because like maybe it's only got one maintainer and maybe that maintainer goes away, right? And so it becomes abandoned where like that's the trade-off I'm always balancing. So in this case, you know, it does seem really cool, but I would, um, the fact that all of my vanilla shit is working for me has kind of got me sticking my fingers in my ears going la, 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 la. Like I, you know, I'm glad you're happy. But I'm I'm gonna stick to uh, stick to the basics um, until I've got a reason not to. And sometimes, you know, your framework will give you plenty of reasons not to stick to the defaults. Um, but I, especially when I'm solo and I don't have like a whole team to kind of paper over the the, the maintainer pain that I'm talking about, I'd, I'd rather just uh, keep it basic. Uh, next question. I'll do one more. Oof. Um. I mentioned Mike McQuaid earlier. Is this that Mike? A Mike writes, as per your most recent podcast, I'm interested in knowing whether you use Intel or AMD or NVIDIA for your CPU and graphics cards and why. So for my gaming PCs, I have become, uh, I got AMD red pilled like six years ago for two reasons. One, they're cheap. Two, they're better. I guess that's pretty straightforward. Uh, <laughs> they're cheaper and they're better. That's great. The other reason is that the um, the, the so-called chipset or the uh, compatibility bucket for a given motherboard, Intel will change those out very aggressively. Every generation of chips will require a new chipset of motherboard, which means that like it has a couple ramifications. The obvious one is if you build a PC with a particular Intel chip, uh, you're now, that's basically married. You're not going to be able to upgrade that CPU later without taking it all apart together, uh, all apart later, 
buying a new board and a new chip and then replugging everything in, which is a pain in the ass. Additionally, something that I think I've noticed is that the people who make the motherboards put less, there's less iteration and less improvement into those boards over the years uh, just because they know this is like a one and done model. They get it out the door and then they don't think about it again. And we're kind of seeing that now in terms of just like how bad all of the Intel motherboard chipset makers are at rolling out and dealing with this particular fuckery where Intel just has these like new high-end chips that are frying themselves. Some of those are happening on the, you know, generation ago chips. And like, it doesn't seem like these uh, board makers are like as good at applying creative BIOS fixes to past stuff because they're on like a model year cadence where they're only ever looking at churning out the next one. Whereas AMDs like, you know, the AM4 or whatever was around for like six fucking years, it felt like. And so like that spec for that motherboard survived lots and lots of revs of the CPU such that you could not only, if you started off um, uh, right when they first came out, upgrade your CPU maybe two, three times over the course of that particular um, uh, 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 spec of, of motherboard, the the people making the motherboards would also release incremental improvements to those boards, still all adhering to that basic spec, but like maybe making a faster Wi-Fi chip or realizing, oh, there's a kind of, you know, a, a radio issue with us placing the Bluetooth over here. So we're going to do whatever, or whatever it is, you know, how we do the antenna uh, line outs and stuff. So I would say for that reason, AMD over Intel is pretty obvious on the CPU front. Uh, on the GPU side, if you want to go high end, it's got to be NVIDIA at this point. Um, if you're in a mid-tier, AMD is competitive on a comp compute, uh, my favorite kind of jam. From a, from a raw horsepower perspective, the AMD graphics cards and the NVIDIA graphics cards are... are in the mid range, they're they're at some kind of parity, or sometimes they are. Problem is that Nvidia has way more sweetheart deals with game developers to have what are called day one drivers, where Nvidia gets early access to the games, and they work with the developer to tune their drivers for that game to maximize performance. Whereas AMD just doesn't have those same deals in place. They've got they've both got some, but they don't have the same extent of them. And and of course, even when the uh, game makers partner with AMD to to be the exclusive or the primary, you know, graphics card of blows and fucks, whatever the game is, the, um, the, the market dominance of the NVIDIA cards at the high end means that, like, it's not like that developer is going to take their eye off the ball and not also make any sort of adjustments that they need to in order for the, those games to work well on NVIDIA cards. So because there's, like, if, CPUs are extremely general purpose devices, and GPUs are, when they're used for gaming, there's so much shit in that GPU that is like one-off and and weird and that the drivers are doing to directly map to quirks of whether it's DirectX or Vulkan or OpenGL, that there's so much on a game-to-game -game basis tuning necessary and like, you know, rules and the drivers are like, if, if the EXE is this file, then behave this way, Right that it the driver story becomes incredibly important to having a good experience, even if from a raw CPU perspective, you know, these things could multiply the same number of matrices at the same speed. Uh, you're going to have a better experience with the NVIDIA cards. That's my answer. I'm sticking to it. All right, everyone. I, um, I think I'm done. I think this is it. I don't... I don't think I can go any further. So I'll see you probably before. Pro oh, all right. Well, here's the thing. September 10th is going to be a busy day. Because uh, we think that's the day that Apple's going to announce iPhone 16, 16 Pro. Maybe some uh, accessories. And then also that night is the um, uh, presidential debate. It'll probably be the only remaining one of those so a lot it's gonna be a lot of sitting on my ass watching other people talk for for a change fair uh, uh but i i have a feeling i'm gonna want to get out either right before or right after the announcements and and pontificate about how this iphone is somehow different than the other iphone even though it's all basically the same fucking thing at this point that's something to look forward to so i'll probably see you no later than september 11th which is a thing that 
uh, you can look forward to, I guess. All right, get out of here.